Hi, Angela. Thank you for being here today. Hi, thanks for having me. Can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Angela Adams, and I am a speech language pathologist. Um, I work for a county, so I don't work for a specific school district. I am at, um, this year I'm at four different sites, so I'm at four different schools, um, and I primarily work with children who have severe disabilities, and then I have some general education students that I work with as well. Well, thank you for what you do. Yeah. So I, I want to start off with the question of what questions should parents ask speech and language pathologists? What are important questions to ask if your child is being told that they're gonna be working with someone like you? What should parents know? Yeah, I think that that's a really daunting question that parents come in and a lot of times parents will come to us and they don't even know what questions to ask. Yeah. And so I feel like the most, um, basic question is just, what can I do? What can I do at home? And there are so many wonderful things that you can do at home um, that are really simple. You don't have to go buy things. You don't have to be a professional. You don't have to have your master's. In it. It's nothing. It's really just talking with your children, playing with them, expanding on the things that they say. If they say um, book, say, oh yes, mommy has a book. Or if they say more, yes, I do want more, things like that. And I think another really great, great question to ask um, is where are we going with this? Mm. So um, as far as that goes, like, are we going to be doing this forever? Because that's definitely something that parents have um, a lot of nervousness about. And so being able to just kind of see like, where do you think this is going? Do you think this is something that we're gonna need more with? Are we gonna need to do outside besides just the school district or do we need to have um, more services? Are behavioral services needed? Are occupational services needed? What more are we kind of looking at for this child? And it sounds like those questions open up the room for conversation totally. to really get into how can I best support my child? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's such a group effort. And so it's not something that the parents should feel like they have to do alone. It's mm -hmm. something that we're here for you. You know, like I have, I give my cell phone number out to my parents because I want them to know that there are certain times where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm not sure what is going on and just shooting a text and be like, is this normal? And I'll either be like, yeah, or like, oh no, that's something we'll work on next week and really have a really good familial session so that the parents are educated on it. The child is educated on it because um, it's a group thing. It's not just something they can come to me and I'll be like, woohoo, I fixed you. It's definitely a group effort. So how long in general are children receiving your services? Yeah, so it really depends child to child. Every single child is different. Um, so we have the children that just come in and they can't say they're ours. And so that is also a developmental thing. So if they come in and they're three, well, the R sound is more of an eight-year-old sound. So at three, if they're misarticulating that sound, that's okay. We can give the parents some tips. That's when if they say wabbit instead of rabbit, we really want to be modeling that to the child. So we don't want to say, oh, honey, look at that cute wabbit. Mm. Well, then the child thinks that that's how we're supposed to say it. So being able to model for those kids um, will really help their time be reduced. And then our other students with our more complex communication needs, um, which are a lot of the students that I work with, that is, it's really just dependent on the kids. Sometimes they're in speech therapy for their whole educational career. Um, and Sometimes they, we figure something out and we get them a communication device and it clicks and then we put them more on a consultative service and we're only checking in with them and it's not something that we're having to do one-on-one -on -one services with. So it's really dependent not only on the child, but also the child's desire, right? Mm -hmm. So I've had some kids that come in and they just, they don't care. This is how they're going to sound. And then that's when we have a family talk of like, your child doesn't really care about this. I really care about this. Well, I can't do much if the child doesn't care about it. So it, it's so dependent on so many different levels, but really um, just child to child based. It depends on how long they can be in it. 
And who decides that the child needs support? Do you wait for your child to say something? If you're noticing something as a parent, do you go to the teacher, the principal, or does the teacher have to recommend? Uh, how do you know that you need support? Yeah, so it it all really just depends on their age. So um, zero to three is when we can really touch in with the pediatrician or um, your local regional program. Um, and then in those situations, it's really great. You can actually even call your local school and just say, hey, I'm having some concerns as a parent. Um, and they can usually guide you to the right people. Um, a lot of times zero to three is your pediatrician is saying, hey, I'm either noticing some signs of autism or um, your child isn't correctly saying these sounds, or it could even be um, the mom is saying, hey, I'm having a really hard time with my child latching for breastfeeding. And that's a conversation that you have with the pediatrician, and then um, they can refer you to a speech therapist. And that's when you could find out, oh, maybe my child has a tongue tie or a buccal tie or a lip tie, things like that, which are really um, can really affect their success with breastfeeding. Um, and then for school age children ages three to 22, that's when your local school district or your office of edu education, which is what I work for, um, we will provide those services if the child is deemed eligible. And then there's also private practices so they can take private pay. Sometimes they can bill your insurance. Um, and those are really for like those supplementary services or um, for services that maybe the school district can't provide because, um, school-based therapy and medical therapy for speech are very different things. Oh. And so um, school-based therapy, it has to be directly affecting the child's educational success. So um, they're having a hard time being understood in the classroom or they're not understanding the questions that the teacher's asking for. Whereas medical therapy, which I'm not super familiar with because I've never been in the medical side of it, but that's a lot more the swallowing side. So your child is drooling a lot or they're choking when they're, they're swallowing their food. And so that side, as a school-based speech therapist, I would say, oh, they don't qualify. However, having some other services such as the medical side of it or private therapy um, would really be beneficial for your child. So, and then, oh, sorry, go ahead. So it sounds like speech language pathologist really work with a wide range of concerns. Yeah, so it's actually really cool in my opinion because I think it's one of these jobs that A, people don't know too much about and mm -hmm. then B, we serve from birth to death. Um, so we, like I said, we can support with suction for breastfeeding. Um, we can do memory care for dementia. We could do rehab after a stroke. Uh, we could do that correct production of the R sound, or we could even work with someone who's non-speaking using a communication device, like what Stephen Hawking um, uses. Mm. Is the, the thing I always say, because some people don't know what that means. Yeah. Um, but as a school-based speech therapist, uh, we're really able to work on those um, really educational based side of it. So we're either doing push into the classroom. And so I go in and I'm working with them while they're in the classroom, or I pull them out into my speech office and we're doing some one on one. And there we're able to work on the oral movements for correct um, sound production or increasing their vocabulary, creating sentences, social communication, which social communication itself is such a broad aspect. So that's eye contact, how to begin, maintain, um, end a conversation, which is such an important tool, turn taking. And then a big one that we also work with is how to give and take jokes, right? So is this joke appropriate to talk about? Or are you being mean to me? Or was that just a joke? Um, and then a lot of the students that I work with have those complex communication needs. So I'm working on utilizing communication devices from high tech to low tech. So is it just a piece of paper that they're touching icons on? Is it a whole device that they're using eye gaze to communicate with? Um, or sign language or other modalities to communicate with outspoken word? Um, and so it's really cool to just have such a broad aspect of what our, our job is and being able to work from 
birth to death and then also be able to work on so many different vast um, aspects of communication because if you really think about it we communicate with every part of our body with our hands with our eyes with our face with our words with our tone um, there's so many different aspects of it and it's not always something that we're taught it's something that we observe but with those children with autism um, or different types of disabilities that they're not picking up on that. So they're not understanding that when I say, oh, it's your turn, besides it's your turn, those are two different things. And so yeah. it's like, what, what pieces are we having to teach the children? So it, it's really cool. That's awesome. And just for those that don't know, can you share a little bit about what type of educational course you need to go on in order to have a job like yours? Yeah. So, um, for in, I went to Chico state, um, in California. And so, um, for that, we do an undergrad program, which is an undergrad in communication sciences and disorders. Mm -hmm. And so you're taking a lot of communication classes. You're taking a lot of, um, uh, child development classes, things like that. You're taking a lot of geriatric classes. Um, and then you have to do a master's program. My master's program was two years long. Um, and that is a master's in speech language pathology. And um, so with that, that's when we're really diving into like the what neurons are innervating what part of your brain and like how do you communicate and what happens if you get hit over here besides being hit over here in a car accident things like that um and then after that uh you are in your cfy which is your clinical fellowship year and it's a one year long program and during that you're in the thick of it and um and you have a mentor who is watching over you, helping you with things. And then at the end of it, they have your career in the palm of their hands and they either sign off and say, you are capable to be a speech therapist or they say, you need to find a different career. And so that's a little <laughs> bit taunting, um, but luckily my mentor was really wonderful and signed off. And so now I'm a speech therapist. <laughs> and it sounds like you have so much knowledge and do such great work. Thank you. Anything else you you would like the audience to know? Yeah, I think um, to me, the most important thing is early identification and intervention. So the earlier we can get a child, the more impact we can make. And um, luckily in my county and the surrounding counties, um, the state provides a free service for eligible children, such as speech therapy, behavioral therapies, occupational therapy, physical therapies, family-based therapies. And um, Personally, I feel like if you're having any concerns, the earliest you can get your child assessed is really important. Even if you get them assessed and they say, oh, nope, this is all totally normal, it's still really important. Um, and then lastly, like I said, and I stress it so much with all of my families, modeling correct and appropriate speech and language is so important. So that's narrating. I mean, right after you give birth, talking about now we're going to change your diaper. Oh, I'm wiping you. Oh, here comes the spoon. This is what we're eating. Talking about every single thing that you're doing is such a language rich environment to give. And those first few months of life are so important. The child is taking in so much. So being able to take in appropriate and correct communication is so wonderful. Um, and then rephrasing what your child said. So if they said the sentence incorrectly, say it correctly for them and show them the correct way to do um whatever it is they're doing. And then expanding on your child's communication. If they say more, say, I want more grapes, things like that. So that they know that they are responsible for their communication. Because if we just give our child whatever they're wanting, then in their head, they're thinking, oh, I don't have to do anything mm -hmm. to get what I want. Mm -hmm. And so they're not going to. Yeah. So being able to give your child that communication and wait them out a little bit. So if they're going, ah, 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 and reaching for the Cheerios, wait them out and see if they will say eat or more or mommy, and then expand on whatever it is, or give them the language for that. And when they're young, you don't have to make them say a whole sentence. You mm -hmm. could just say Cheerios or eat, and then wait for them to do some sort of imitation of that. Even if it's not a full word, it's just an eh for eat, that's okay. Mm -hmm. They're giving you something. And so then we reward that because then the child is accepting that 
I have to do something in order to get something. Mm -hmm. And that correlation is huge for communication because that is what communication is all about. We don't just talk for fun. I mean, sometimes we do, but most of the time we are (laughs) communicating in order to get our needs met. Mm -hmm. And so if our needs are being met without communicating, we're not going to communicate. That's silly. It's way too much work. And so why would we do that? So all of that stuff is really, really important for communication development. Such valuable information. Thank you so much for being here today. And for those of you at home, if you haven't yet subscribed to Mind and Body Pilates, a wellness approach, please do so by clicking on the logo below. And thank you so much, Angela. Thank you.